it's boat shopping season. People are just starting to head back from the Caribbean and list boats for sale. Price drops across the board on Yacht World are starting to slow down and people up north are starting to pull the winter covers off. We're actually starting to see some new stuff hit the market and prices are kind of stabilizing. So let's go shopping. Before we get started, we're still looking for skilled writers over at Practical Sailor. We've got some amazing talent so far from you guys and some very good articles that have come from those people. But we always need some more. If you've got the experience and want to make some money writing for a sailing magazine, head over to practical-sailor.com forward slash apply. Submit an article aimed at a sailing magazine and follow the instructions on the page. I can't wait to hear from you. Lots of people spend a hundred grand on a boat to go cruising, and what to buy in that price range is fairly straightforward. It gets a little more complicated though when you shrink that budget down to say 50 grand. The options are endless, and of course, we want to find a pretty good deal. As always, it depends on what you want to use the boat for, and I'm going to avoid any major project boats today like this catamaran, a Prout from 1990. There are lots of these down in the islands with very happy owners aboard, but this one is definitely a project. It needs a lot of work. And while it does suit a purpose, it's not what we're after today. We want something that's in good working order if we can find that. Which brings me to what a lot of people buy in a budget of 50000 or less. That's prime territory for an older racer cruiser, something from the 80s with adequate living accommodations inside should we want to sleep on it, but being an 80s racer cruiser, something that's a proper sailboat. And you'll notice I put racer first when I said racer cruiser. That's because the first boat that catches my eye in this budget is a racer. In St. Pete's, someone listed this gem of a CNC 41. CNC has been making boats since the 1960s, formed by sailing legends Cuthbertson and Cassian, hence the CNC name. Cassian came over from the Avro Aero project, so he knew a thing or two about going fast. And CNCs, they go fast. You'll find things like inboard jib tracks, inboard shrouds, high aspect keels, and giant winches for both the jib and the spinnaker on boats like this. You'll find these out there winning club races all over North America, but leaving your neighbor's Beneteau in your wake is not the only thing this boat can do. For some reason, CNC took things fairly seriously on the inside too. They fitted the boat with a nice galley, a good sized saloon, a proper nav desk, and even a little bed in the back. None of these things are things you'd use in a club race. So what would CNC thinking? Is this a race car or an RV? The answer is yes to both. CNC is known for excellent glasswork and stand-up production, and while this boat may be from the 80s, it surely has a lot of life left in it. You'll find racer cruisers like this all over the place in lakes and coastal ports, but also down in the islands. They're good at basically everything. I have one of these racers and while you won't have all the latest comfort, you will be more comfortable at night because you'll have gotten to the anchorage first and got the best, most protected spot. Everyone else will have to sort of pile in behind you because you take speed seriously. You point higher, you tack faster, and carry more boat speed over distance. But this won't be relaxing. It'll be fun, and for 42.5, we won't get a sugar scoop or a big bedroom in the back. We won't get a 14-foot beam or twin helms, but we will get a rock-solid racer cruiser fully capable of being comfortable in a minimalist sort of way. But what if we drop the racer from racer cruiser? What if we just want to buy a tank to get us there, no matter what the weather does? The 80s gave us those too. And you better believe that if comfort and reliability is your goal, Robert Perry is going to have you covered. Perry is world-renowned as a designer of heavy, big-keel ocean crossers, and a few boats stand out with him, but none more than 
the Tiana 37. In the world of 80s Taiwanese-built Pacific Ocean crossers, this double ender is the granddaddy. The 37 has been doing more miles around the planet than Neil Armstrong. It's parted more seas than Moses. She's been a poster pinup of what a sailboat should be for decades, a thing of beauty, loved by many and sailed by proper old salts the world over. This one is in Fort Pierce for 45 grand, and you better believe it'll be sold by the time you're watching this video because Tiana's sell almost as well as they sail. She's got dinghy davits, a wind jenny, and she's the cutter rig. That's the one you want. She's a full keel, Yanmar powered, electric, windless, having battleship, ready to ply more oceans. The seller's pictures here are terrible, but they are motivated to sell, and sell this will, despite its wooden spars, its tighter cockpit, despite the fact that this isn't a boat with a sugar scoop or an aft cabin. My only gripe about buying a boat like this, and this is just me, but I know me. I'm power hungry when it comes to electricity and I need a really strong solar setup. Well, this boat can withstand any sailing environment that I'm likely to throw at it. There's just no room for solar, not the amount of solar that I would need. The back of the boat is just too narrow for a big arch. The boom is too far aft. Fitting the thousand watts I would want on a boat like this is just not gonna be possible. But my goodness, are these ever beautiful. Straying away from these older boats for a minute, what if we want something modern, something a bit more family friendly, at the sacrifice of ocean plying seaworthiness? What would 50 grand get us in the newer model market? Actually, it's not terrible. An early 90s Benny 370 is sitting down in Gulfport for 48.5. Again, the owner used a potato to take pictures, so I'm going to supplement it with stock images from another ad. But the 370 is a very nice boat. We get that cockpit for entertaining, a sugar scoop to snorkel from and let the kids in and out of the boat easier. This is all very nice. Up top, we get lots of opening hatches and port lights, a proper double spreader rig, loads of deck space, and an anchor locker with a windlass. Inside, these are extremely roomy for their size with lots of room for entertaining and lounging around, nice wood finishes and lots of space, so it doesn't feel tight or confined in here like it does in an 80s boat, that cave feeling. It just sort of isn't here on this one, and that's really nice. This one for sale in Florida has a Volvo with 2,200 hours on it. And other than mentioning that she was detailed recently, they don't really tell us anything else in this ad, which brings up a point. When you see a boat on Yacht World for 48 grand, it's usually listed with a broker, probably always listed with a broker. And that broker doesn't stand to make very much money on a sailboat this old. When they're used to selling million dollar sport fishers, that's why this listing and a lot of listings like this aren't very good. That's why the listings usually suck. The pictures are terrible, like this boat, and there's almost nothing to go on in the write-up. I would hope SRQ yacht sales would do better, but this is what we get. To really figure this boat out, you're going to have to go see it. If you can pick up a tidy 370 though for 48 grand, it'll all have been worth the effort. If I lived on a lake or just wanted to tool around the coast with some kids on board, this would be the right tool for the job. I might even cross over to the Bahamas on it once in a while, provided the wind was southerly and less than 20 knots. The mission here at Lady K Sailing has always been to get more people sailing more easily. And I really couldn't do this stuff without the team of patrons that make it possible. Thank you so much to those that support this work. If you'd like to help support that mission for as little as a couple of bucks a video, please consider becoming a patron. And the last boat. We do love a Pearson around here. A late 80s 36-2 has been sitting in Port Charlotte for a while now, and judging by the jerry cans on deck, she's already been some places. I've actually looked at this boat with somebody I was consulting with, and she really is a hidden gem. Pearson is known for heavily laid glasswork and quality builds, especially toward the end of the 80s when they made this one. And the 36 is one of their best boats. If you had to explain to somebody totally alien to sailboats, like say a powerboater, what an 80s cruising boat was, you would use this as an example. It's a typical cockpit with wheel steering. It's tight, 
but it's comfortable for two people. It's got a swim platform on the back and solar panels on the top, a propane locker built in, and lots of gadgets to get you to where you're going. Inside, we get a galley with enough counter space to cook for two, and a top-loading fridge, and a double sink that really should have been a big single. Nothing fits in that little side, I promise you. We get benches down either side, opening port lights, and even a little bedroom in the back, which is kind of rare for a 36-footer from the 80s. We even get this baby Victron 7015 mounted on the wall crooked to drive the OCD among us a little bit crazy. And remember this MPPT controller, because we're going to talk about it in a minute. These Pearsons are wonderful boats. I actually raced last year on a Pearson, and we took first place overall. And that was an 80s boat too. They really hold it together over the years, but that brings me to what worries me about this boat. Two things. First, that's not a swage fitting. Is it Staylock or some other brand? I'm not sure. Any fitting that you can do in your backyard with hand tools makes me worry about who in fact did the rigging work. You don't always have to pay an expensive rigger to swage all your rigging, but when you don't, I'd like to know who did the work. And second is this screen. Well, not the screen itself. I like the new Raymarine displays, but the way it's mounted. We obviously had some extra bimini parts left over from our solar array build here. Cool, we put them to use. So we made a little stainless rail to mount the screen to. A couple stanchion bases, some pipes, some 90s. Okay, I'm with you. But remember how you mounted the solar controller. Kind of sloppy. It makes me wonder if when you drilled the six holes into the cord coach top roof here, you over-drilled them first, backfilled with thickened resin, re-drilled, and then bedded each screw down properly. This is six holes in the coach top that didn't have to happen. And this is important because if any one of those screws leaks over the years, the water's going to go into the coach top, down the inside, and then into the side decks where these boats are known to rot. This kind of stuff makes me nervous, and I see a lot of it when I do consults with people helping them buy boats, or perhaps more often helping them rule out a specific boat. If you need help, you can book an hour of my time by heading over to ladykaysailing.com forward slash consults. So that's what I found for 50 grand, but remember, it's very early in the shopping season, and we're going to see a lot more to come. And speaking of what's to come, Practical Sailor had just sent me down to Miami to the International Boat Show, and I got to record some of the brand new boats. I made a video of four of the 40 footers that I was on to show you guys. Some crazy design choices, and I mean crazy stuff. I was shocked. If you want to check it out, it's over on the Practical Sailor channel. You can get there by going to this link. And don't forget to like and subscribe while you're there, please. It's a brand new channel. That's it for this week, friends. Until next time, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. I love you guys. Mm -hmm.